Hello, uh, welcome to lecture three of part four. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to be talking about diagnostic accuracy. Okay, we're going to start off with the basic structure of diagnostic studies. So you generally start with a series of patients and you have an index test, which is the test of interest that you would like to compare uh, to your reference or gold standard. And you compare the results of the index test with the reference standard. And hopefully, at you know, uh, the ideal situation, it is blinded. As always, we start with an example. This is a recent paper from this year, 2020, um, from the Lancet Oncology Journal. Uh, and it is looking at uh, the ability of an artificial intelligence machine learning algorithm to identify and grade uh, prostate cancer biopsy cores. So the series of patients uh, was 976 randomly selected participants, all male of course, uh, ages 50 to 69 from a Swedish prospective study. They also tacked on a smaller cohort of patients, 93 men from outside the study. The index test was an artificial intelligence machine learning algorithm that was trained on all of the images of the slides from the needle core biopsies. Um, the algorithm was trained to classify benign or malignant, as well as to grade uh, the malignancies uh, using the Gleason score. Now the gold standard, no surprise, were expert uh, pathologists and they were used to label all of the slides as malignant or um, benign. And they also uh, graded a subsection uh, of the biopsies uh, um, you know, using the Gleason score. So accuracy in this case was reported uh, using the area under the curve, which uh, we will talk about a little bit later, but it's interestingly, uh, you've uh, just learned about PROC Logistic in SAS, which performs logistic regression, and the um, ROC, the receiver operator curve, um, is generated using PROC Logistic because your outcome is binary, so meaning you know malignant or um, benign, but your independent variable or predictor is continuous. Um, and the um, uh, what the goal of the exercise is to find the threshold that maximizes both the sensitivity and the specificity of your test. And your area under the curve represents um, both sensitivity and specificity together. Now they were very um, successful and achieved um, an area under the curve of 99.7%. Um, which is fantastic and they also measured um, agreement between the pathologists and no surprise it was actually fairly low with a kappa of 0.62 and we're going to go over agreement later on in this course um, but they uh, found that the agreement uh, between the algorithm findings uh, was also about uh, the same as the pathologists so that was very interesting so just quickly as a refresher, series of patients, men 50 to 69 with suspected prostate cancer, the index test is an AML, AIML uh, classifier, malignant yes, no. It also does some grading uh, using the Gleason score. The reference standard is board certified urological pathologists. And finally, the test that uh, was used in order to produce the results of the accuracy were, was a, a test set of 330 cores um, and the, um, the uh, index test produced a result of an area on the curve of 98.6%. So what we're gonna cover in this lecture is diagnostic reasoning the basic design of diagnostic studies, uh, apprising a diagnostic study in three easy steps. And then of course, because we are in an intro to stats course, what do all the numbers mean? So apprising diagnostic tests, three easy steps. The first is, are the results valid? So what I mean by that is, are we using the appropriate spectrum of patients does everyone get the gold standard? Is there an independent, blind, 
or objective comparison with the gold standard. Now these are all fairly straightforward, but it's always good to review them. So what do you mean by appropriate spectrum of patients? Ideally, tests should be performed on a group of patients in whom it will be applied in the real world clinical setting. And of course, this points towards um, the challenges of generalizability of your findings uh, to the population of interest. Now, in this case, um, they did, they certainly did a good job, um, but the only thing you could say is that most of, if not all of their um, subjects were, were most probably Caucasian because this was a Swedish prospective study. So in this case, ethnicity would not be, would not have been studied. Now you may think this is obvious, but ideally all patients should get the gold standard or the reference standard test. And this is something you should consider when you're evaluating a diagnostic test. In this case, um, they, they passed, uh, everybody uh, did get the, um, uh, you know, reference standard. And, and the reason uh, we know that's the case is because uh, we could not have tested our algorithm if we did not have labeled data. And in this case, the data was labeled by the expert pathologist, which is considered the gold standard. Finally, uh, when assessing the quality of the gold standard, be sure to check whether it's independent, blind, and objective. So here's an oldie but a goodie. So this paper is from 1999, JAMA. Um, and what it did was it was a, a systematic review that looked at um, evidence of design-related bias in studies of diagnostic tests. So here is the pièce de résistance of the paper, and what it is showing is the relative diagnostic odds ratios for study characteristics uh, when examined using multivariate uh, regression analysis. Now, the relative diagnostic odds ratios indicate the diagnostic performance of tests in studies failing to stat satisfy the methodological criterion and it's relative to its performance in studies with the corresponding feature. So here's an example here of bias. So when the study was not blinded, you can see here that the relative diagnostic odds ratio is greater than one, which means that it is an overestimate. So if you don't blind your study, you tend to have a diagnostic odds ratio that is an overestimate compared to a study that would be blinded. Now you can see here, there's a whole list of study characteristics that could potentially introduce bias into your diagnostic um, study. Uh, for example, if just using a case control, uh, difference in res refer reference tests, uh, partial verification, uh, we just went over not blinded, non-consecutive patients, uh, it's a retrospective study, uh, there's no description of the test, no description of the population, and no description uh, of the reference, so the reference standard. So up till now we've been looking at the validity of the results, and in, this, in the previous slide we looked at the systematic review from JAMA that expressed a whole bunch of study characteristics that were important um, to be met in order to reduce the possible bias in the results of your diagnostic study. Now next what we want to look at is what are the results and so we've already touched on it already in the results we're going to want to look at things like sensitivity, specificity, likelihood ratios, you guys all know about that now, and predictive values. So once you've finished sifting through all the results and you're satisfied that this is the diagnostic study for you, the last question you're going to want to ask yourself is, will this diagnostic test um, help me look after my patients? So for instance, how can I do the test in my setting? Do the results apply to the mix of patients I see? Will the result change 
the way I manage my patients? And is there a cost to uh, the patient or to the healthcare service? So will the result change management? Well, if you consider a linear progression of from 0% probability of disease on the left here to 100% probability of disease on the right, you can imagine that you are going to transition between three st states going from left to right. When you're pretty sure that they do not have the disease, or you're absolutely sure, then you're going to take no action. If you're unsure if they have the disease, then you're going to want to test. And if you are pretty sure or certain that they have the disease, then you are going to take action and treat. Now, what separates these three uh, states are going to be thresholds. You have the testing threshold, which separates no action to testing, and the action threshold, which separates testing and action. So what do you have to consider if you were to apply the test in your setting? Well, the first thing is, will the results change management? Also, will the reproducibility of the test and interpretation in my setting be the same as what was reported in the diagnostic study? What's the impact on outcomes that are important to patients? And where does the test fit into the diagnostic strategy? And of course, is there cost to patient health services? All right, let's get back to some stats. So in the ideal world, a test would have perfect discrimination. All patients who have the disease are identified by the test. And all the patients who do not have the disease have a negative test. Now here is the familiar two by two table. In this case, we have disease in columns, positive and negative for disease, and the test in rows, positive test, negative test. Now, what we just stated when perfect discrimination would have all of the values in these two quadrants, true positives and true negatives. Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. And so the other two quadrants are false positives. So this is when the test says yes, but actually the patient doesn't have the disease. And false negatives when the test says nope, no disease, but actually the patient does have disease. Let's review what is sensitivity. It's the proportion of people with the disease who have a positive test result. In this case, it would be um, taking the true positives and dividing by the total of true positives and false negatives. So a test with 84% sensitivity means that the test identifies 84 out of 100 people with the disease. Just a quick example, if we have 84 true positives and 16 false negatives, Sensitivity will be 84 over the total of 84 and 16, which is 100, which is 84% sensitivity. 84 out of 100 people with the disease. How about specificity? So specificity is the proportion of people without the disease who have a negative test result. And so it will be true negatives divided by the sum of true negatives and false positives. Okay, quick example for specificity. If we have 75 true negatives, 25 false positives, then specificity will be 75 over 100, which is the sum of 75 plus 25. So a test with 75% specificity will be negative in 75 out of 100 people without the disease. Okay, some quick tips. Sensitivity is great. It is something that everyone looks for uh, in accuracy. An example is the new rapid COVID-19 test was positive in 47 out of 56 persons with COVID-19. This yields a sensitivity of 83.9%. Now specificity is a bit trickier. It does seem a little confusing. So the new rapid COVID-19 test was negative in 600 of the 607 persons who did not have COVID-19. 
specificity of 98.8%. So what can I recommend? Well, the false positive rate is sometimes easier to comprehend. The false positive rate is simply one minus the specificity. So a specificity of 98.8% means that the new rapid COVID-19 test is wrong or falsely positive in 1.2% of people tested. A quick example, if you have 600 true negatives, seven false positives, we can say that there were 607 persons who did not have COVID-19. The rapid test was falsely positive in seven of them. This leads to a specificity of 98.8% or a false positive rate of 1.2%. And we got this by one minus the specificity of 98.8%.